Once again, Pat, welcome. We have limped into another Friday. I, tell you, I know we missed last Friday, but um, Fridays go by quick, don't they? Without even trying, it shows up. Yes, sir. Okay. It's crazy. But uh, hey, before we get into the numbers, I want to share something. There's an event that I've been made aware of that I'm going to attend. And uh, it's called the 28th Annual AG Forum. American Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers. Well, these are people that meet and uh, talk about, you know, the appraising of land, appraising of farms. Uh, this is going to be attended by a lot of agricultural appraisers, uh, real estate attorneys, and experts on water. And they're going to be talking at length about projections for water for agriculture in Arizona. It's going. It's a two-day event in Tempe. I put the link down below in the description if people want to take a look at registering for it. And it's uh, it's uh, um, March 1st, Phoenix, Arizona, Friday. And uh, I believe it actually starts on the 29th on Thursday. So, like 29th. Yep. Yeah. So it's a two-day thing. Here's Thursday, February 29th is a class. And you get, if you're in the industry, you get uh, six hours of uh, continuing education. But so I'll be happy to come back and let everybody know what I've learned from that, especially from water. And, uh, and if you're in the industry, this sounds like a fun event. There's a lot of networking going on too, so it might be might be worth entertaining. Again, the link is is down below. And uh, hello, Danilo, welcome, happy Friday. So interesting, interesting week. Uh, I know rates went up, and I want to jump in and talk to you about that in a few minutes. And I want uh, people, if you have any comments, we'll get to them when we can. Probably towards the end, but more than happy to answer any questions you have about this crazy market. I am not in Phoenix right now. I'm down uh, in El Paso, Texas, house sitting for my good friends. They're uh, up working on one of their Airbnbs. But I want to start with this comment that I saw on the Cronfrey Report, and I don't expect anybody to read this, and I'm not going to go through all the numbers, but I thought you'd appreciate this, Pat. It says here, altogether, there's not enough to get excited about if you're longing for positive movement, talking about the data. On the other hand, there's also not much to get excited about if you're hoping for the market to crash. I have nothing to satisfy either of these positions. In other words, it's not moving either way. When I look at my seven-day moving average here, um, see if I can pull this up. I got it on the wrong page. I can see it, but you can't. So here it comes. Hang in there with me, Pat. You can see that the blue line here, which is new listings, went down, 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 and then kind of spiked up a little bit. And new contracts also followed it down and it came up a little bit. But the gap is still uh, healthy enough to where we're seeing some price gains, if you can believe it. And it, but it's still matching almost the exact same pattern as last year. Um, it's just it's crazy when you look at that on a on a week by week basis. Here, what we're looking at is the average list price per square foot, and I've been kind of harping on this being pretty optimistic considering where we're at, and it's still that way. We'll see if there's any adjustments last week. So it begs the answer: Well, how many price changes or reductions are we seeing? And it's they're up there, 1979 on the week of February 4th, but uh, but below last year. So we're not we're seeing higher price cuts, which we always do in February. But it's uh, it's not massive. When we look here, Pat, at our uh, Crawford Market Index down on the bottom, you can barely see it starting to turn down a little bit, especially when compared to last year. See how it's kind of dipping down a hair. So the market is softening a hair. But having said that, as depending on who you talk to and what part of the valley people work at, it's either really dead, really bad, or extremely brisk. I mean, it's it's not it, – it, is it safe to say it's a dead market, but it's not dead? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting. I mean, I'm – I went to this uh, commercial bankers uh, networking event on Wednesday, this little thing that we have once a month with commercial bankers. And uh, that's just kind of the sense that I'm getting around just talking to mortgage brokers, other mortgage people. You know, I, I look at, 
you know, Facebook feeds from different mortgage people, um, you know, talking to realtors. Uh, it just it's one of those markets where it's not going up. It's not going down. Uh, I liken it back to 07, 08 when, you know, it was the opposite end where we had 50,000 homes and nobody was buying. And now we've got no homes and nobody's buying kind of the opposite end of it. But it's just um, there's just no rhyme or reason lately for this market. It's just been kind of there. There's yeah, no, yeah. it's, it's just, you know, I talked to some mortgage people, they're doing deals. Um, but I'm going to do a little, this is a little quick PSA. You know, if people are looking to buy a home, um, yeah, just be careful because you have a lot of mortgage guys out there looking for deals, but plain and simple realtors, you know, agents are looking for deals. And, you know, when you get people, desperate people, they're going to say desperate things to try to win you over. I'm just this kind of a PSA. If somebody's looking to buy a house, one thing is if you, you have your credit pulled and you're working with a mortgage guy, um, you trust him, he's doing a good job for you. Once he pulls your credit, you're going to probably get 30 to 40, 50 phone calls from what they call trigger leads. And um, these it's mortgage people that can, the credit companies sell these trigger leads. Once you pull credit, they sell them and they buy them. So you got Joe Smith that in some call center in California calling a guy in Arizona and say, hey, I can, whatever your deal you're getting, I can get you a better deal. You're going to get a lot of that. So just buyer beware because these trigger leads um, really bring out a lot of snakes. A lot of people that say, oh, I could do this for you. I could beat you. You know, I could beat that guy all day long. It's really horse, horse manure. <laughs> and Well, it's uh, kind of like when you sign up on LendingTree.com. You're just signing up for... Yeah, to put your information everywhere. everywhere. That's all you're I mean, signing up for. Yeah, Lending Tree basically they're not a lender. They basically just they're a company, or they're a conduit that sells, uh, aggregates the information. They sell it to four, five, six, ten mortgage people, and you're gonna get hammered with uh, with uh, quotes. So it's just you know if you're working with a reputable mortgage person, just you know it's it's good to shop, but you know there's a point in time where you you're gonna get inundated. One thing is people could do. If they are going to have their credit pulled, they can do go to what's called optoutprescreen.com about three, four, or five days before they pull, you know, somebody pulls their credit. And that will eliminate, they should be able to eliminate most, if not all, the trigger leads phone calls. So just just kind of a PSA. But say, and say that name, back, name again. It's called Op opt, Street. opt out opt 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 out prescreen.com. Okay. So it's just a quick PSA, but to go back to the market, you know, yeah, it's just been kind of one of those markets where it's it's not dead, it's not brisk, it's just there. And um, I mean, you look at the, you know, today, you know, the you know, the obviously the numbers came out, PPI came out hot 0.5%. They're they're anticipating 0.1% uh decline. But I kind of like it. I mean, my my two cents theory is I think uh some of that. Uh, which I've never heard anybody talk about, but I think it's kind of, uh, this is just my own little economic theory. I think the Red Sea shipping costs, you know, you saw the last couple of months, these, this Red Sea, all these shipping costs, you know, the shipping costs have gone up probably double or triple from what they say. I don't know what the exact number, but I think um, that's kind of thrown in. Uh, that's just my two cents worth. That's being thrown into some of the numbers, the, the hot numbers. Yeah. That and our federal spending. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. I'm just that I'm, Trying to keep one topic. It's our, our federal spending is is yeah, we can go over crazy. Hello, I mean, Jackie. Got a couple of questions here. I'm gonna guys, I'm gonna get on this a uh, little bit here. We got uh Daniel asking if I can our building permits tracked on Cromford. They're updated about once a quarter. I can't seem to pull them up here, but I did want to show and Pat, you and I have talked about this before, and this is the heat map mm -hmm. for activity. So Anything in this beige color between 80 and 100 is hotter. The darker beige is considered a frenzy. So if you look at it, Gilbert is 80 contract ratio between 80 and 100 is, is hot. But some parts of it, of Gilbert, are in a frenzy. Same with Chandler. The ever popular zip code of 85226 is in a frenzied market. Well, I'm um, right next to it. I'm 225. Yeah, parts... <laughs> Part, you know, nobody wants to live next door to you. They want to live just slightly near you. So um, Mesa, 85203, 174. That zip code is a frenzied market. Now you've got others, not so much. 
you know, this is balanced, balanced. Um, and this is uh, cold, Phoenix 85043. But when we get back to talking about, you know, what are you hearing on the market? Um, it's, it's, uh, the volume is low, but it's, it's not, uh, that, it's not that, falling off the face of the earth. Just to go back to that map. I mean, that map kind of signifies the market. It's just kind of like one hot, you know, like I said, some mortgage people are busy. Some are, you know, a lot of them are just kind of, you know, puts along. I mean, it just seems like it's kind of a, it shows what the market's kind of like hot, cold, hot, cold, you know, in different areas. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's so, you know, when somebody gives you a general conversation, how's the market? Where do you live? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had a quick question that I can answer right away here. And that is from Daniel um, saying, like to see new listings and contract ratio. You show data. Here's the new listings now. Now this is every year, each chart here. You can see our new listings for February are down versus last year by about 500. Mm -hmm. Now the contract ratio, I'll pull up here in a second, but um, it's uh, it, it kind of mirrors what I'm seeing when I track the seven day moving average, and that is that uh, that it's going a little slow. But let's let's jump in with the rates here for just a moment because it it was not a good week this week. How come? Uh, just the hot the hot inflation numbers, basically. You know, CPI, the PPI. I mean, the market's been you know came out in November saying we're gonna have six rate cuts. The market got ahead of itself. I mean, the market got over its you know its head over its skis or its knees over its skis, however you want to put it. Um, you know, we saw, you know, this is basically the uh, 30 year MBS five and a half coupon. I mean, when it's high, that means rates are low. So when it's going down, obviously inverse relationship to rates. So you, you saw it, it got slapped yesterday. Here's this one, um, here's the, the red candle right here for uh, a couple of days ago. It's just, it's been, it's been brutal the last, uh, let's see here, since about the first of February, the last two weeks has not been fun. Uh, but I think you overall, you look at it though. Uh, let me see if I can pull up. Um, it's we're still in this channel. I mean, you know, this, this is the, the 10 year treasury. Yeah. Here's, here's a peak at, you know, end of October, we bottomed out, obviously end of December, you know, we saw it three, seven, nine, Right now we're at you know four two eight on the treasury, you know I think uh, there's just I think I said a couple months ago I think we're going to be stuck in this channel. Yeah, rates have gotten worse, you know instead of the mid mid sixes high sixes you know low sevens now, um, not it's enough to make people pause again, you know so it's but once again it's the market got ahead of itself it's correcting itself I mean we're gonna have to wait and see what the federal the, you know, the market uh, numbers next week, the uh, Fed comes out, the FOMC minutes, that'll be important next, you know, next Wednesday. So, it, but it does underscore what you and I have been saying. And that is that, you know, when, when rates started coming down, everybody jumped on the bandwagon saying four to six rate cuts this year. And yeah. the people that were saying it, you know, they don't know, and I don't know. And yeah. so to say it and to make you make, a purchasing decision based on that, I think is, is, uh, is just not right. And, you know, it's, you know, marry the house, date the rate. Well, you could probably still do that because odds are we're going to be looking at lower rates next year. Uh, but you know, do you want to bank on that hundred percent? No, but to say that we were going to have four to six rate cuts this year and blast social media, like agents were doing, it was, it was really driving it's me crazy. It's disingenuous, I think. I mean, I, for lack of a better term, I mean, it just, um, it's, you know, you're, you know, you and I have talked about it. I mean, I, you and I have been pretty right. I mean, why, you know, both of us as We're far pretty as lucky. Trying, yeah, right and lucky. I mean, hey, but um, I just, you know, six rate cuts. I just, my personal feeling, I said this a couple months ago, I'll take credit for saying this. I just didn't see if I was, Jer Jer you know, Jerry, you know, obviously the letter that we sent obviously made a big difference, but, you know, if I'm Paul, They've, they've been so wrong the last couple of years that they don't want to get this wrong. And uh, for them to pull the, I just, in my gut said, it just might, you know, just watch the markets, how they trade, what people are saying. I just, I, I get a lot of information from different sources. I read a lot, you know, I try to make my own conclusions, but 
I just did not see it where Paul, well, these guys were going to say, we're going to pull the trigger in March. I can't believe that these multi-million dollar analysts on Wall Street were saying, oh, you're, you know, there's still some people pounding the table that we're going to see a March rate cut. Now it's 100% off the table. But I just, my gut, I just put myself in Paul's shoes and say, you know what? We got to be right this time. And if we pull the trigger too soon, if they start lowering rates, now they put themselves in a real corner. Because uh, now once they lower them, you you, <laughs> you can't put toothpaste back in the tooth you know toothpaste tube. So I think they're gonna sit here for a while. You know I think March you know May March. Um, you know uh, my my gut. It's just my gut. You know for you that in a quarter I'll get you a cup of coffee. But you know if we see two rate cuts we'll be lucky. Um, where do I see I, rates I, heading? The next thirty yeah. days. I mean. I got this one rate uh, gentleman that watches rates. He kind of comes out with a commentary uh, hammer. Um, they call him the hammer. But um, he says, you know, the next, you know, if you're looking to lock in the next week or two, if you got something closing, you know, lock it now. But he goes, anything past 30 days to sit tight, they'll probably back off a little bit. I'm sure we're going to see some news that's going to have rates back off a little bit. If they back off, though, we're probably going to maybe see mid to high sixes, nothing too crazy. You know, there's just nothing in the in the works that says we're going to see rates drop that dramatic. Um, and that's the beauty of like being me, being a broker. If so, if I lock somebody at seven, they do go lower. You know, it's not a big you don't want to do this, but I can flip a loan to another lender, you know, versus being locked in it. But once you lock a rate, that's basically you're, you're telling the lender I'm going to I'm locking in at six and three quarters or seven percent because if rates go up, you guarantee me that. And if rates go down, well, that was kind of the, the risk that I took. Yeah, yeah, and the the uh, um, I'm not I'm not optimistic about huge improvements in inflation for a lot of different reasons. One is simply federal spending, and I showed it a few videos back showing the the amount of money that's being spent. And Q3 was there, and then you know, hearing comments that say, "Well, they're going to lower rates because of the election." No, there is no connection to that. Get that out of your head today. That they. They have nothing to gain by doing that. And look, in the 80s, um, you know, they, they, they raised rates and then they lowered them again, but they lowered them too soon. They reignited inflation. So to say that they're going to lower rates because of the election. So let's just assume that the current Fed chairman is, is, loves this, this party that's in charge now and he wants to keep them there. Is lowering rates the best play? Because if they bring them down, and we're sitting here with an election not coming up till November, they'll reignite inflation. Is that good mm -hmm. for the current administration? Hell no. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, and conversely, if they raise rates too high, they'll make things really bad and it'll look bad for the administration. So staying put may be the best course if they're really trying to ma manipulate things for the election, but there's no connection. I just don't yeah. see it and I haven't seen mm -hmm. it. And so I think the only people need to kind of, roll that one back. I, yeah, I agree. I, the only connection I've seen pretty strongly made the last couple of years is I've in 25 years, I've never seen a period of time, you know, the last couple of years where, you know, even inventory and demand supply and demand, especially demand is so dependent on rates or so rate sensitive yes. rates are yeah. coming down. Um, you know, and so it's proven, I mean, I, <laughs> Nobody can refute the, the 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 evidence is there that if rates did go, you know, you have these people sitting there saying they're going to wait till rates get in the mid fives before they buy. It is a proven fact you're going to have a hell of a lot more competition buying a home at five and a half percent than you are at high sixes, low sevens. And it's just it goes back to you know, look at your own situation, see you know what you can handle because um, I the demand is it's amazing how much demand picks up when rates start moving down. Well, here's the question uh, that uh, asked about the contract ratio and almost disappeared on me. It has gone up to 51.3% from a low last month of 38.2. So more homes are going under contract in relationship to new listings. So it's not, it's, it's climbing. It's not, uh, it's not reducing. Um, running at altitude here says there's a lot of inventory in Maricopa. And I will check on that for you in a moment. Uh, Jackie says early 90s. Yes, we had the same problem back then. Um, a lot of the outlying areas, Pat, we are seeing 
um, mm -hmm. a lot of inventory um, because of new construction. And and uh, we're still, the, the builders in Arizona have gotten very optimistic. I don't see the permits right now, but I've seen some articles that they're they're starting to grab a bunch of land right now. And they're getting ready um, for the future being good for building. They would not be scooping up land if they thought this party was going to end pretty soon. Now, having said that, they've certainly been wrong before, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try and find here inventory. Um, I can't find it there. Let's see. I found, uh, oh, there we go. Let's see. Trying to find my topic here, active listings by city. Here it's coming. Are you ready for this? Um, I am. I, Give you know, you're me. on pins and needles. You can, you can feel it here. Oh, Here's yeah. Phoenix. We're kind of right at last year, right? But let's, let's jump to Maricopa and see what's going on there for folks. And, uh, they are a lot of listings there, but there were a lot of listings there last year. Last year at this time, they had 571. This year they have 510. Um, back in 2022, they reached a peak of 685. So while there's a lot of listings, these are ones that are just on the MLS. Now, adding to that is going to be all of the new builds that are out there. Um, and uh, so here's one, Dr. DR Horton by North Peoria. Models are not complete. And the division is already half sold out. Better get the real estate mindset out, mindset out here, Jackie. Take a, take a look at that. If we go to Chandler, which is that one that I showed you was kind of frenzied, you can see they're below 2023 levels here, 270 versus 304. Um, and in Sun Lakes, I like looking at that because it's a retirement community. They're their own little economy, right? <laughs> they're at 63 homes, last year 77. And in 2023, let's say that's 2020. 2023, yeah, they had... 94. 94 homes. So there's not a whole lot going on down there. What about Sun City, which is another mecca of retirement homes? You can see they're pretty much mirroring last year at 190 versus 201. So that's the inventory story. Um, I think at the beginning of the year when rates started going down, we thought this is going to be a brisk spring. Now, I was skeptical because I didn't feel that there were going to be rate cuts in the spring and that it was going to be, um, you know, pretty wild out there. And I think I got lucky by saying, you know, I don't think so. Uh, but I think the optimism is, is, is sliding a little bit. Um, where is Peoria? It's Northwest of Phoenix. Um, so Lenar the, always uh, deals and deals. I got a rep. I work with Lenar is amazing. Never bad time to ask. So, um, so I think, um, that, that optimism has not turned to pessimism yet though, Pat. No, it's just kind of sitting there in this bucket of muck. <laughs> you know what I am seeing in social media and there's a lot of real estate forums out there. There's a lot of sellers really beating up their realtors because their house hasn't sold and it's price. Now, that doesn't mean the market's crashing and their house isn't worth what it was. They've just priced it where it's not. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's if it's only worth $450, you are not going to get five. No. no. Um, and it's not the realtor's fault that you're not getting five. What else do you want them to do? They've taken great pictures. You've made it look nice. It's in a good neighborhood. It's on every website knowing the man. They're paying for advertising and getting it out there. They're holding open houses. If it hasn't sold, it's price. Yeah. No, it's – market's trying to find try, – the market's trying to find some direction, and there's nothing there. Yeah, just kind of moving along. Kind of like what you and I have been saying the last couple of months. It just I – mean, I don't see a lot um, that's going to push it either way. Well, you predicted it was going to muddle. Yeah, we're yeah. – we're, we're, we're muddling. Muddle. Now, let's talk about – we're sitting here at the end of February now. What could make things pick up in March between now and five weeks? Well, actually, three weeks. What could make things pick up in March? 
Uh, I mean, obviously the number, you know, numbers on really the, you know, the numbers next month, uh, you know, the Fed's meeting, you know, it's going to be all related to the Fed, see what the antis- what they're anticipating. I think the rate cut talk is going to be the biggest thing. It's push rates pushed out lower. You're going to see more demand. That's the only thing I see right now happening. I think if you see a CPI report that comes out and it's a, a good one, I still think they're going to wait it out. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. I think they will. But. You have to, you know, that what they do and what the market does are two different things. The markets can anticipate, you know, a couple months in advance. Like, okay, we, the market and the feds are two different. While they're kind of cousins, they're still, you know, they're first cousins and maybe fourth cousins because they're, they're not related. And the market will read into you. That's why, that's why I watch the daily market to see how the, you know, you see the tops on, you know, the 10 year treasury to see where it's kind of trading at. You see the, you know, the resistance levels. You know where the where they come back in, they knock it down. So it, it's just going to be one of those markets. I, I just don't see anything. You know, not to be, I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer, but I'm just trying to be a, I'm trying to be more of a realist and say, okay, it just it's kind of a grind out market. It's a grind out market for agents, grind out market for mortgage people. It's grind out people, <laughs> grind out market for people who are trying to buy a house. It just um, the problem is the Fed. You know, we saw inflation fall from nine down to say the threes. You know, that was the easy part of it. Now it's the hard work is, you know, trying to get it stabilized or come down a little bit further. Now they got, there's going to be a lot more. It's going to be the low hanging fruit on all the, in, you know, the inflation has gone off, off, if that makes any sense. It's going to be hard now for it to really pound it down further. Well, it's interesting watching too, because remember when we had the big rate hike, um, this is what happened in 2022. We, we got up to 19,000 listings. So that's why we started seeing all these prices coming down. And now we're just hugging right along last year. Yeah. We yeah. actually matched last year. We we're at 2023, 14,783. And we're the same in uh, 2024. We're 14,745. We're right there. Yeah. Now, where's it going to go from here? Well, looks to me statistically like it always starts to. Yeah, go down unless you get a shock later. So I think for now we can expect, based on history and where we're at now, that that inventory will slowly decline. Yeah, and this will not put downward pressure on prices. In fact, yeah. if anything, it'll do the opposite. If sales stay right where they're at, I saw a YouTube uh, channel the other day, and the comments that were coming out were just. We're just wild to read, you know, like I can't even get pe- people can't even afford to buy cars. What makes you think they're buying a four hundred thousand dollar house? And the and the uh, the realtor said, well, they are. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, but they are. Yeah, yep. I mean, there are people that can't or people that can or and people that need to. Yes. You know, so. Um, would you bet overpaying in a market like today for a property is good for future equity? Well, that's the debate. And what is define overpaying? Um, that's that's the debate. I mean, there. If you're waiting for price to come down and you're convinced that a long downturn is coming, then there's your answer. Okay. And there's plenty yeah. of good data and information you can find that can justify that. That's a strong possibility. But on the other side, there are numbers out there and scenarios that can tell you that there's a possibility equally as strong that prices could go nuts yet once again for a period of time. For example, if we really get in a pickle where high sustained rates are having a problem with, with our debt and and like, for example, right now, we're, we have to finance $1.2 trillion in debt. Mm-hmm. How do you do that? By selling treasuries, right? Yep. I've read that there's $8.8 trillion out there in debt that's maturing that is going to have to be rolled and refinanced too. And that gets refinanced by selling treasuries. Does that put upward pressure on rates if all of a sudden in 2024... You have to sell $10 trillion worth of treasuries. Oh, yeah. No doubt. So you've got two choices then. Either 
massive upward pressure on rates because of the amount of debt that we have, 34 trillion, and refinancing that. Or once again, the central bank comes in and goes, well, I guess we'll have to start some form of quantitative easing again, starting to print some money to help us. We will be buying these treasuries, which is essentially printing money. So both scenarios are out there. We're either going to have a real downturn in the market or those in charge are going to say, well, we're just going to have to risk inflation coming back versus things, you know, going south too quickly. So I only raise that because I don't know. And either does anybody else uh, out there on YouTube and uh, or even in the market. But it, those are the things that that we watch. Um, so overpaying could be. Yeah. Uh, what they, do you think, Pat? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, well, I think the biggest thing is the, the they got. I think the market's been in kind of a schizophrenic area because you got fiscal policy and monetary policy working against each other. If they were working together, I think you'd have a lot more fluidity and natural movements of this market. But you've got two things, two forces working against each other. And, you know, Barry Habib had said, you know, they're right now, obviously, the feds are in a quanti quantitative tightening, meaning they're just letting, you know, um, stuff mature and roll off their balance sheet. And he said they could come back and, you know, do some quantitative easing, which they're buying, you know, their, their the debt. So, you know, it's a tough call. There's so many different factors out there now. Um, you know, you got inflation. Um, it's just, it's a tough call. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah. It's way, way above my pay grade. That's why I just try to watch where the markets just try to get a feel of the market, the psychology of the market. You know, and right now I just get the feel that everything is just muddling along right now. And they're going to have to do something about this debt, you know, to go back, not to get political. But when you got a government that's sending $95 billion overseas, uh, kind of like you and I saying, you know, hey, Rick, can I borrow $5? Like, yeah, no problem, Pat. You know, they're sending $95 billion over like like nothing. That's, yeah. you know, that that's just a problem. You know, it's just it's. Not to get political, but I'm just I'm stating the facts. It's just like we're just we're spending money like drunken sailors, and that yeah one one fact is trying to stop. trying to pull it back in. The other one spend spend spend. Yeah, and uh, and so the question here: Won't more families start listening in May for the end of school year? Typically and seasonally, yes, we do see that. Um, the Phoenix market kind of operates like this: We see the most new listings come on in January and June. We see the most price reductions show up in February and July. So you've got this wave of optimism in January. I'm going to list. I think it's going to be good. Let's go. Oops, that didn't work. They pull back the prices in February. Yeah. Same thing happens in June. Our schools start here about third week of June or July. So people want to move before that. How big of a number that is, I don't know. But it is, um, um, it is um, enough to increase inventory but it also increases sales at the same time and that's what the Crawford market was just talking about here that said normally when inventory increases the sales follow and we're not seeing that yet i'm gonna put I'm gonna, throw, I'm gonna throw a little jibe in there though you know being in phoenix i don't have any kids never been married no kids blah 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 but um i've noticed back when i was going to school we got out in may and we went back to school <laughs> you know end of august september now you've got a lot of, I mean, I'm just throwing this out there, but correct me if I'm wrong. There's a lot of school districts that start, they, they start at weird times. They get like trimesters and, the, you know, they're, so there's different school districts that start their school year at different times. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, they are, but on average, they start yeah, on, anywhere a, on average, yeah. The, the yeah. third week of July to the first week of August here, Yeah, which sounds awful, but for people that don't live here, understand, they also have an October break for two weeks. Yeah. Um, and be honest with you, your kids are not playing outside in July and August anyway. So having them home, they're just staying home while you're cranking the AC. So they don't mind going back to school then, um, you know, because they get to look forward to the. No, that's what that's what October parents do play. now. That's what parents do in Arizona now. If their kids are bad, they send them outside in 115 degree heat. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's back, rough. When we were, back when we were bad. You, you, we had to go back in your bedroom, you know, for for yeah. penalty. Yeah, we send them outside. We send them outside. <laughs> Here's our pending listings here, Pat. We're below last year. 
there was last year and here's where we're at. So it's, it took off and everybody goes, here we go, here we go. And, uh, it didn't, it, it didn't go. Um, yeah. here's one here it says, uh, I'm 50 days from closing and looking to lock. This is the craziest roller coaster I've ever been on. I'm never buying a new house ever again. <laughs> it can stress you out, can it, Chris? Yeah, that's a, that's the thing about that's the market with new builds. You know, you're you're looking out three, four, five, six, seven, eight months. You know, what do you do? You know, that's put people in a lot of quandaries the last couple of years as far as a new build. Um, what do you do? You know, um, that's one of the big. You know, I've seen con. You know seen i've seen deals go sideways because rates have gone up you know we saw that in the last couple of years where like now we don't qualify so it, it's that's the that's the risk you take on a new build certainly big time as far as okay, you're so i got one that happened on a condo this week and we've we've warned people about this and we tell people every time they buy don't open a credit card don't buy a car don't open any new lines of credit while you're in the process right mm-hmm Getting ready to close, they do a soft pull. Guess what? This buyer opened a new line of credit, and he goes, "Yeah, but I haven't used it." Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah. So what do they do? Well, they're waiting for more documentation. They need proof that he hasn't borrowed the money. And then with this condo, those condo certs that we're waiting for, it's a problem. We're two weeks behind on closing. Because of the condo certs. Yep. What Take that into consideration if you're listing your condominium. That closing date, that 30 day, don't bank on it. Yeah, condos it may are happen. So. Yep. Kind of like we warn about condos are just a different animal amongst themselves. Um, hey, real quickly here, I want to do a plug. Um, for anybody looking to buy, I, mean, I, I talked to you about this. Um, this is just for agents out there or for new, you know, first time home buyers. Uh, Fannie Mae, basically, they've got this um, program. Home, it's a home ready program. Can you pull up my screen here? Yes, sir. Uh, this this map right here, it's, it's hard to see, but this is kind of like Phoenix, some Phoenix metropolitan area. This is the west side of Phoenix. This is you know uh, Mar Maricopa. I this is down probably Florence Eloy. There's different parts of Phoenix that. If a somebody is a new time home, first time home buyer, which means three years or less, or three years, or you know they haven't bought a house within the last three years, um, it's kind of a cool program that it's called Fannie Mae Home Ready. First, every lender's got you know not every lender, but it's kind of funny. It, there's different lenders that are giving different amounts of money. There's one lender out there that's given three thousand dollars grant. It's basically just a grant that you can use for closing costs or buying your rate down. I've seen some lenders, it started coming out a couple months ago. I'm not, not quite sure when it kicked off exactly, but it's been hanging around here the last couple of months. But it's called Home Ready First, or uh, you know, basically Home Ready First, I guess is what some, there's special purpose credit program, SP, SPCP. And for realtors that are watching this or first time home buyers, um, it's a cool program. If you're a first time home buyer, and it's not, where you're buying the house, but it's where you live currently. So you could be um, in West side of Phoenix, but buying in Scottsdale and you, there's one lender out there um, just for keeping it anonymous. There's one lender out there that's offering $10,000 on this credit. So Fannie Mae is kicking in money and the lender can kick in money. This one, like I said, it, it'll, it'll vary from 3000. I've seen the highest to be up to 10,000. It's just a grant. It's basically free money. And um, there's no income restrictions. You can make a quarter million dollars a year and still get this credit. Like I said, the biggest caveat is um, you got it's got to be you got to be in that area where you live currently, because a lot, a lot of mortgage people, realtors or agents are confusing it, saying, well, where's the house that they're buying? It's not where you're buying. It's where you live currently. So take a that's a new one. Yeah. Um, the minimum down payment, you know, three percent. It's a home ready th three, you know, basically home ready, three percent to five percent range. <clears throat> three percent is a minimum. Typically, five percent you get a little bit better pricing than three percent on the home ready. The home ready program, basically for first time home buyers, it basically gives you minimal. It knocks out those loan level pricing adjustments. Um, it's it's one of the first time home, you know, 
this first time home buyer programs, people call me like, yeah, you got first time home buyer programs. That's kind of a misnomer because there's 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 out there, but they're not like, oh my God, this is a killer program. You know, they're, they give yeah. you some breaks on, on certain programs, but the home ready, it knocks out the loan level pricing adjustments. And there, there's lo usually lower mortgage insurance on this uh, by about 10, 15 basis points per month. So it's a pretty good program. Um, and the rates are typically lower than a regular conventional loan. So it's a first time home buyer program, which is cool. Mm -hmm. But this SPCP program grant, it's it's killer. I mean, it's basically free money. So you just have to find the right lender. Like I said, the the amounts will vary. I've seen, it's kind of weird. They'll vary from three thousand up to ten thousand. So if you pick lender X, it's five thousand. You get five thousand. But this one lender's got ten thousand, um, and and also they pay for five hundred dollars of appraisal and a five hundred dollar warranty on top of that. How do the rates compare, Pat? Are they slightly higher in a program like no, that, or are they conventional? Bar? No, they're actually home. The home ready programs are typically a tad cheaper than regular conventional because you don't they take out the loan level pricing adjustments accordingly so that that it, it'll, it's basically a little bit cheaper loan for home buyers see that's that's a lot different than those uh first time home buyer grants that we were seeing early on where yeah. it looked attractive getting this money but the rate was not attractive <laughs> yeah down payment assistance program this is not a down it, it's i guess so called the down payment assistance program but um down payment assistance programs those are not free I mean, because you're paying it in rate and you're paying it. They have usually extra fees. Um, they get that money back somehow on down payment assistance programs. But this is a grant that Fannie Mae came out with. And it's only certain areas of the country. There's, um, you know, it's like Houston, Texas, Cal some parts of California. It's nationwide, like Virginia, D.C. Or it's just Miami, Florida. There's a certain map. And, you know, if people are interested, they can email me and I can put in their address or where they're looking to buy or know where they look currently live. See, see, I am getting mixed up once in a while. Um, yep. But uh, where they currently live and if they're looking to buy, I can tell them if they're eligible or not for the, for the grant. So. It's interesting that they would mark our market as one of those for down payment assistance. Um, well, like you said, that map, well, that map goes to show you, I mean, I, I showed it. It's, it's, it's for like people, uh, you know, West, West Phoenix, um, it's not all over. I mean, let's see, I'm yeah. trying to find um, where the heck was uh, my map again. Well, it's like New Jersey. There you go. It's a, it's it's like West Side. It's a here. I mean, let's see if I can find it again. Where the heck did it go? Uh, I just saw, uh, oh, oh, Arizona would probably probably be a good start. A's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the map. It's the color coded where if you live in these areas, you know, this is like Central Phoenix, North Phoenix, uh, you know. West of the 51, you know, there's certain areas, pockets in here by Mesa, you know, in here. Uh, this is like Maricopa. This is like Buckeye, that, you know, west side off the I-10. You know, if you live in there and you're looking to buy a house, even anywhere, you can get, you know, you can qualify for this grant. So they can call it leaveyourhood.com. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I probably here is the uh, seller contributions, Pat, percent of closings with seller concessions we're at 45 percent the average is 9200 um so those are still there i point that out because if you're listening anticipate people asking you for seller contributions for closing costs there it's going uh <coughs> mostly for rate buy downs yeah so i think uh, it's 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 a beneficial thing rate buy downs temporary once again i'm i am a much bigger fan of that right now than anything before. Well, if you're already looking at the rate, you can afford that payment. Yeah. 6.7. The house fits my budget. It's not squeezing me out. I can afford that. Um, but somebody else is willing to pay to buy down that rate for a couple of years. The risk is not that you can't afford that payment, but that you get so comfortable with that lower payment that you start piling on over debt then a couple of years you overextended. So you got to be smart. Yeah. You got to be, you got to use budget it accordingly. But you know, if you're, if you're good at that, that's a good program. Yeah. It gives you, it, it gives you a lot of short-term flexibility. Like I said, the big, it's huge savings within the first year, you know, five, 600, depends on the loan amount, five, $600 a month, which is, that's huge. Like I said, it could, we qualify people at the higher rate, but you know, it's just the short term. They're taking advantage of short term, um, you know, 
subsidy, 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 and uh, they can pay down a credit card. They can pay down a car payment, you know, in the next year. And that way it loosens up another $600 for them. Or they could, you know, keep the same payment that they're getting qualified at and just pay more down in principal. Yeah, keep the payment the same and just keep paying it down. I agree. But if you got a car payment, there's your opportunity to get rid of it. Yeah. You know, if you're going to budget, budget and uh, stick to it. I think that's a good plan. I wish I'd have done that on a couple of my homes. Uh, I know I went through uh, very wild swings all throughout my my life. And uh, so, you know, if you're looking to buy real estate in the short term, you know, bless you for your efforts. It's usually uh, it doesn't work out that well unless you're really trained at being a, an investor in a flipper. Uh, but if you're looking to buy your first home, plan on staying there and yeah. uh, plan on staying there for a while. It's interesting that I did see um, an article that said that baby boomers, and it's a survey, I think we shared it a couple of weeks ago, they're not willing to improve their homes before they sell them to the next generation. Upgraded bathrooms, 67% said no. <coughs> um, new carpet, uh, just modernizing it, making an appeal to a uh, younger generation. Uh, baby boomers are just saying, eh, I'm leaving it like it is. It's my house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, dig your heels in all you want, but you're open to a much wider audience if you do make some. And some of the improvements are simple um, bathroom countertops that have yellowed over time and those lights above that are just outdated. Spend the money, get that done. Bathrooms are a big deal. Yep. Yep. No doubt. And, uh, and kitchens. So it, uh, kitchen countertops. At the same time, you know, <clears throat> buyers, um, you know, try to look past some of the cosmetics, <clears throat> realizing that a lot of it you can do. Get a decent price and, and do that yourself. So then again, you go back and say, okay, I can get a 2 1 buy down. I'm saving $600 a month. Use that to improve your home. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're going to stay there for a while. Yeah. The casitas are getting extremely, increasingly popular now. What's that? Casitas. Yeah. Buyers are looking to get a house that's got an extra living area, either for friends and family, aging parents, or using them for short term rentals. It's getting more and more common. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of. That's the thing you look at too is when you're buying a house, what kind of land, you know, how much land you have behind it. You could do something like, you know, that too. You know, what I'm saying if you got a, a large lot that they allow that, that's something to consider down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I think if, if I'm looking at, at this market right now and I make a prediction, prediction for now and through the middle of spring, um, more of the same. Yeah. No, no big moves in interest rates. And sales are going to just kind of stay where they're at. If you're selling, um, try not to listen to the white noise. It's not bleak. You can sell your house. Sales are brisk enough to where it, it will move. Um, it's a pretty good balanced market right now. As much as you want to say it's just kind of, uh, yeah, not busy, it is kind of balanced. I mean, uh, there's business out there, you know, if you want to go out after it. Um, it's just, it's uh, it's interesting. You know, we I think we've been so used to the whipsaws the last 10 years back in two, 2010, 11, 12. And then the last, you know, 19, 20, 21, you know, now it's just like, OK, it's kind of calm. So I did you see that? Uh, did you see that Altos research thing? That thing I sent you? I haven't had a chance to watch the whole thing yet. I watched part of it. Um, can I just say this for any viewers out there, if they want to e email you or me, um, you know, there's a copy. I mean, I got a the re replay on it. This guy, they go into deep, a deep dive into supply and demand and, you know, active supply, kind of like you do, but on a national basis too. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'll throw that out there. If anybody needs it, you know, I, I can email them that link. And um, another thing I'll tell people is if anybody's out there, got a current house right now, I've got, you know, I've got access to a, uh, some pro profiles, property profiles. If you want to email Rick, we can get you a, a property profile on your current home. Um, it's kind of a good, you know, it's what, five, six, seven page breakdown. You know, it's, it's not exact. Yeah, it's a lot more thorough than Zillow. Zillow tells you what your estimate is. 
what you yeah. provide is you actually list all the comps, shows you the range, shows you the value, shows yeah, you all the statistics you, for your neighborhood. So if you, if you want to email Rick and then we'll get the address uh, you know, locked in. I mean, it's just kind of a cool, kind of a cool report to send out to people if they're interested. Now our you know, closing is over list pricing, Pat. Uh, haven't changed much. They've gone down a little bit. They're they're fifteen percent, fourteen point seven. Uh, but the average is only about five thousand dollars, so you're not seeing a whole lot of movement. And the closings over list pricing are all concentrated between three hundred thousand and five hundred thousand dollars. So not a lot going on out there when it comes to bidding wars. But again, with that first heat map that I showed you, there are neighborhoods where you can't expect that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're yeah. gonna heat up on you. So is that well, one whole heated map? It's just one. It's very, very uh, bits and pieces. Yeah, it's definitely not all one color. Well, everybody have a great weekend. Uh, we have our millions and millions of viewers as we have become to become uh, used to. And we didn't break the Internet, so we'll give it another shot next week. Pat, have a fabulous weekend, huh? Yep, you too, buddy. Thanks, everybody. Right. See you, everybody.